space, and for those of us that got to uh, take the tour earlier, it is amazing the things that happen here on campus and for how long um, they've been here. Uh, we have a few other special guests quickly with us tonight I want to recognize, starting with the members of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. Um, induction to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame is our state's highest honor, and I'm pleased that we have a couple of men who hold this distinction with us this evening. Uh, obviously, Dr. Kenneth Cooper, uh, our speaker, and then Tom McCaslin, um, here at the other table one right here. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. I also uh, would be remiss, uh, Mr. Pickens could be with us tonight, but Jay Rosser is here um, in his place, and uh, Jay's been a big part of our program since we moved into the museum, actually prior to moving into the museum uh, for 12, 11, 12 years now. So thank you for being with us, Jay. Um, also, we have Amanda Clinton from our board. We have Virginia Grondike, our chair elect. And we have Edna May Holden. Um, thank you each for being with us tonight. And also, even though you were not, for those of you that did not ride the bus, which was a blast, Amanda Clinton has, on your way out, um, Amanda, where are you? Are you here? Uh, has provided party favor swag for you on your way out from the Cherokee Nation. So please, she calls it propaganda. I'm telling you that you have a swag bag. <laughs> I'm Seminole. We communicate differently. But, but please, again, thank you, Amanda, for being so generous. Uh, I think you have the seasons of OCO in here? Three seasons. Three seasons of the Emmy winning OCO is in your bag. So, again, thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, so, um, I'm also excited that we have two of our Second Century members here representing our Young Professionals group, Lindsay Funk and Morgan Roberts. Thank you for being here. I also want to thank our friends from Medallion who are with us tonight for joining us in our mission and telling Oklahoma's story through his people. Friends of, the, friends of the Medallion have a shared passion for preserving Oklahoma's unique history while promoting pride in our great state. Their support sustains us at the Hall of Fame to tell the story to tell the story of our people. Thank you for your support in making all of our programming possible. If you're a guest tonight and are new to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, which many of you have said I'm not from Oklahoma, and that's okay. <laughs> We're glad you're with us as we celebrate our shared heritage of, of, as Oklahomans and learn a little bit more about who we are and what we do as an organization. Hopefully you've noticed the photographs that are on the screens, and you've seen some of the special Oklahoma experiences that we offer at the Gaylord Pickens Museum throughout the state that promote our history and our heritage. At the heart of what we do is our belief that there are no limits to what is possible. Every day we celebrate the legacy of inspiring Oklahomans with all generations because we believe Oklahomans are changing the world. In telling Oklahoma's story through the lives of its people, we create deep connections with our history and our heritage. History isn't made by time, or occurrences, it's made by people. When we understand this, we're challenged to think about what we too can do to impact our communities, our state, and our world. When we share the defining characteristics and values of Oklahomans of the past, we can advance those same traits in ourselves and take pride in our ability to create real and lasting change throughout our society. We're fortunate because we have seen the waves of change Oklahomans have made every day, and we see this very clearly in the life of our honored speaker tonight, Dr. Kenneth Cooper. Known as the father of aerobics, Dr. Cooper has shaped the way Americans view fitness for 50 years. Dr. Cooper, Dr. Cooper, preventative medicine pioneer and founder and chairman of Cooper Aerobics, introduced the concept that exercising in pursuit of good health when he launched his book, when he launched his best-selling book, Aerobics, in 1968. That book is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. A former Air Force flight surgeon, Dr. Cooper invented the 12 minute and 1 minute, 1.5 mile fitness test and aerobics point system. Recognized as the leader of the international physics fitness, physical fitness movement and credited with motivating more people to exercise in pursuit of good health than any other person, Dr. Cooper has long advocated moving the field of medicine away from disease treatment to disease pre to prevention. Help me welcome 1983 Oklahoma Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. Kenneth Cooper. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, it's an honor 87 years of age to be anywhere. But I uh, hope you had a nice uh, tour of our center. I'm sorry you couldn't see our clinic, but it's in, the, means it's in the midst of a major reconstruction. Of course, that uh, means we've been successful. That's what we're having to expand. But yeah, let's go back uh, many years ago because I spent some 13 years in the military. The first uh, two and a half years, I was in uh, the Army and in Fort Sill. 
down at Lawton for about almost two years. That was a trying time for me because that's where I met Millie in Lawton, Oklahoma. She was working special services there. I'm happy to say we got married some 59 years ago, and I'm happy to have her here tonight. And after transferring to the Air Force to go into the space program, I thought, aerospace medicine program, and to become probably a sinus astronaut. I did work with NASA for two years. I helped develop the trainable stress testing for the military, or for the NASA program, which has now become uh, ubiquitous. Now, we had problems in the early days with the treadmill stress testing, which worked out the details, but we were able to uh, now have done over a quarter million treadmill, maximum performance treadmill stress tests here with practically no problems whatsoever. So we've proven that. But still then, in 1970, I realized that my career, 13 years in the military, didn't have that much of a future unless I wanted to give up the career I had developed in the Air Force. The Air Force put me through two, put me through two years at Harvard, a Master's of Public Health, 1961-1963, and a year in exercise physiology. I was the Air Force's expert in exercise as medicine, but then in 1970, I read my first two books in the Air Force, they wanted me to move on and become the commander of a hospital because I was a lieutenant colonel, consumed me promoted to a full colonel, and you can't become a full colonel, or you can't really expect to be a general officer in the Air Force unless you have some administrative experience. So I make a very important decision. So at 40 years of age, pregnant wife with Millie, pregnant, no, pregnant, Millie was pregnant with my son, Tyler, who's now the CEO of the organization, and a five-year-old daughter, we decided to leave San Antonio and come to Dallas on a wing and a prayer because it was difficult making that uh, decision. Bob Buford wrote a book entitled The Halftime. In this book, he says, you can be successful but not significant. I think of the situation I was in. In the eyes of the Air Force, I was successful, but I really wasn't accomplishing that much. Too many restrictions of being in the military, serving in the government. So I decided to go out and start from scratch. And for the first uh, few months, we came to Dallas, Texas, and had a little two of and two employees down in Preston Center. And it was difficult. I had to go before the board of censors because I was doing something as dangerous as treadmill stress testing. But before the board, I wasn't censored. I gave a very lengthy presentation. I've been doing the Air Force, and the second person in town had the treadmill for stress testing was the chair of the board of censors. Going on, fast forward then to 1971, still down a little tour of office on the Center, and I had a very prominent pastor here in town who had heard me speak at a luncheon. He was 57 years of age, way overweight, wanting to get in shape. So I encouraged him to come by the clinic and have an examination, which he did. I put him on the treadmill. He lasted two minutes. Before I stopped him, I said, your EKG is so bad, you have severe coronary artery disease, you need to be hospitalized immediately. I don't believe that. What do you mean? Well, I saw my physician just recently he said everything was fine. Do you do a stress test? They say, oh, that Cooper's a quack on to run him out of town. Don't do that. That's dangerous. Don't take a stress test. Because your rest of EKG is normal, no problem. I said, okay. I'm washing my hands in your case. I called his physician. I'm in my 62nd year of practicing medicine, hard to believe. And the only time I've been cursed out by another physician was from this physician called said, you quack, what you doing? I'm running out of time trying to steal my face. I said, hold the phone. This man has serious disease. I don't believe that. Okay, I'm washing my hands in his case. Nothing was done. And 10 days later, sitting at his desk in his church, he collapsed and died of a heart attack. And keep in mind, the first most common symptom of severe heart disease is sudden death. People don't realize that. But that really stirred interest in the concept of stress testing. And now it's going all the way forward, as you'll see in a few minutes, that in 2016, the American Heart Association said in the, in the publication circulation, if a physician doesn't do the maximal stress test in conjunction with an annual examination, that is not a complete exam because your aerobic capacity, that I was almost kicked out of town for determining, is a better predictor of future coronary events than high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking. That's the kind of trouble we had back in those early days. Fred, I appreciated your prayer very much, because people, while we've gone from two moths and two employees, this magnificent facility here, a lot of ups and downs over the years, and we've been bankrupt once, had three years at the start from scratch. That's typical kind of being an entrepreneur. But I've always said, the reason we've been successful here is two reasons. Number one is divine intervention. I'm very strong in my beliefs. There's so many times over the years I need to make a decision. I want to go this way, but I think I'm with the other way. If I go the way I want to go, I wouldn't be here today. 
Number two is a fantastic staff. You saw a couple of those leave this tour tonight. We have almost 600 employees here. We have 24 positions, and we're one of the best staffs in America. I'm very proud of my staff. That's true as your school teachers, too, you know, because a, a corporation will be just as successful as the employees make the CEO. That's all it is to it. And I really compliment my staff. Number three, we've proven, you'll see this in the presentation, we've proven that it's cheaper and more effective to maintain good health than regain it once it's lost. Preventive medicine, when I was in medical school back in the 50s, Oklahoma City, they said preventive medicine is the Cinderella of the medical specialty because there's no profit in health. The profit's the disease. I thought they were right the first couple of years. I didn't see much profit. But look what's happened over the years. But finally, number four, if people realize they have a need, you provide a service, they get the results they want, they make you successful in any field. 147,000 patients come this money from one to 47 times in the past 47 years. We're also finding that 54% of our patients are corporate sponsored and 74% are return patients. They're getting what they want. I tell my physician staff daily, patients come here, here, they pay big dollars for the examination, but when we take insurance, we're overwhelmed with patients because we get results with our patients. Because I tell my physician staff, our patients are equally concerned about how much we care or about how much we know. And we've lost that in medicine. Get them in, get them out. We spend an average of an hour and a half with each patient. Only see four patients a day going through the clinic. That's why people come from all over the world to come through our examinations here. Half the people come from outside the Metroplex. They come from foreign countries. I have taught people in the world coming for the examinations here. And when they come back, and it's able to us to have a database of over two million persons of follow-up on those patients from which we publish over 600 papers proving that exercise is medicine. That's kind of background of how we got started here and why we've been so successful. Now I want to go ahead and I want to show you what really made us successful, of course, the publication of the first book in Roby's back in 1968. It came out in hardback form and softback form at the same time as a feature on Reader's Digest. That's what took it worldwide. It was the first two books for features that tear off in Reader's Digest. The book came out, though, again, great criticism. Because back in those days, we only had about 40% uh, 40, 40 of our people that were, were walking, 24% were walking regularly, and then only about 100,000 joggers. And I would see titles of medical newspapers that said the street's going to be full of dead joggers that were Americans following Cooper. That's how vicious it was back in those days. So what happened then, when the book was published, it was actually, it wasn't until 1986, we put a definition in the dictionary, Oxford Institute, that's what put in the dictionary. It's a method of physical exercise for producing beneficial changes in the respiratory and circulatory system, activities which require only you know, modest increased oxygen intake, and so it can be maintained. As I mentioned back in 1968, 24% of our adult population exercising, 100,000 joggers. The book came out by 1984, we jumped to 59% exercising, and 34 million people claimed to be jogging back in those days. Now, by 1990, we had 40%, 30 million. 2008, we had 37 million. The numbers now are about 25 million still jogging, and around 40% are, are exercising regularly. Well, as predicted by the critics, was there an increase from deaths from heart attacks? To answer that question, they quote that famous medical journal, the Wall Street Journal, in 1984. They said that deaths from coronary heart disease began rising sharply in the 40s and reached a peak in 1968, and then mysteriously again began dropping. It didn't go up, it went down. And from 1968 to 1990, we led the world in reduction of deaths from coronary disease. It said heart disease going up, it went down by 48% in that period of time. Only three countries had accomplished this history. Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. But most countries around the world had, uh, had the reverse phenomenon. In 1990, I was invited to speak behind the, behind the old nine curtain. I spoke in Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev, Russia. I spoke in Warsaw, Eastern Poland, and Budapest, Hungary. The reason I invited to speak behind the old nine curtain is because from 1960 to 1990 in Russia, they had a 31% increase. In Poland, 36% increase. Hungary, 40% increase, and the record was Romania with a 60% increase. Sure, Dr. Cooper, it's because you're modern technology. We don't have coronary care in our hospitals. We don't have angioplasty, and stents and bypass surgery, and they don't have expensive medication. I said, hold the phone. Because you look at that 48% decrease in death from coronary heart disease in 1990, only 33% because of medical, medical technology, 67% because of lifestyle change. 67 percent. Well, who did that? 40, 76 million people born between 1946 and 1964 led a health revolution we've never seen before, nobody seems said. And those were the baby boomers. 
Well, we're just reading today, we have uh, 86 million uh, millennials, millennials now. It's the largest of our population, it's roughly 18 to 35 years of age. And they're changing the statistics in America, not uh, the least of which they're drinking a lot. So I discovered what they're talking about today. But the baby boomers, they led a revolution. They decreased death from coronary heart disease by some 48%, but also increased life expectancy by six years. In a two year period, 10 year period, you'd expect a life expectancy to increase two years. It should have gone from 72 to 74, it went from 72 to 76 years. And that's the only time in history, and that all reached a peak in 1990, and then started going the other way. But what did the baby boomers did? Number one, they quit smoking in great numbers. They dropped from 46%, hard to believe now, 46% of Americans were smoking in 1968, down to 24.9. You smoke a pack a day, it doubles or triples the risk of having a heart attack. As compared to the non-smoker, the former smoker, or someone who's required to inhale somebody else's smoke. 49,000 people die every year because they inhale somebody else's smoke. They quit smoking in great numbers. Number two, they had their blood pressure checked. Back in those days, we had only 15% of our population with hypertension. It increased to 55%. So high blood pressure above 140 over 90 is a killer. But you can control that. There's no reason why you should have high blood pressure with modern medications and lifestyle. Next to the list, they lowered their, their cholesterol. Back in those days, when I was in medical school, we were taught that cholesterol was normal up to 350. We always thought that was normal. There was no clear correlation between cholesterol and heart disease because we didn't know that you could have good cholesterol, which is the, you know what it is? The good cholesterol is the HDL, and the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL. And what is the best way to increase the HDL cholesterol? Physiologically, the answer is exercise. That's well accepted. If you want to build up that HDL cholesterol level, which acts as a ruler rooter and can destroy some of those soft plaques, can dissolve it and keep the LDL from sticking, you better exercise. And that's why you think that exercise is a major factor in reducing death from cardiovascular disease because of high HDL. So that middle-aged American male during that period of time, 40 to 49 years of age, dropped his total cholesterol from 234 down to 204. Dramatic change. That's what the baby boomers did. Uh, what about stress reduction? Well, as I've said in one of my books, Can Stress Heal? It's not the stress that kills, the way you handle stress that kills. And baby boomers were learning that it's not stress, but it's the way you can handle it. Hans Selye once said that stress is a spice of life. Would life be like that? There's no runs, no hits, and no errors. It's not stress that kills, the way you handle stress that kills. Freeman wrote a book, Type A Behavior in Your Heart. And he said if you're a type A individual, you're going to, it can kill you. Die early of a heart attack. You should become a type B. The truth of the matter is you can't change your personality. And if you're a type A, according to his book, you will answer yes to these questions. Number one, you salt your food before you taste it. Number two, you plan today what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Number three, if you can't stand for be silence in conversations, people like to finish sentences for you. That's a typical type A. People ask me why I talk so rapidly. I say because for 49 years I've been trying to finish a sentence before she does. <laughs> hey, she's an A plus all the way. You don't know what I'm talking about. And number four, if you're a type A, you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, worry about the day. If you're a type A, you can't stand for that plane to be delayed. Be caught in traffic, pretend in line for anything. And if you're a type A, so he says, you can't stand to be defeated by a child in a game. That's all type of behavior. You can change your personality, but not much. So you have to compensate for that, according to Hans Sayed. And finally, increase physical activity. Look at those in reverse. What's the best way to control stress, as I've done for over 50 years? Exercise at the end of the day, prior to the evening meal, so I can put up the stress day so I can sleep at night. It's a very, very important thing. Number two, as far as cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, blood pressure, the best way to prevent blood pressure elevations is to exercise, and one of the best ways to treat it is to exercise. And if you want to break the serious book and have it permanently, start an exercise program. So I think that's what happened. We have to understand, too, a very important point. It's our lifestyle which is killing us. In America, 76% of our disease is a result of our lifestyle and 45% of cancer are preventable. We spend way too much for health service dollars on desperate measures, often prolongs death, not life of miserable few days. We spend twice as much money on health care, 20.7 trillion in 2016, as any other country in the world, yet we rank 43rd in longevity. That's not a very good statistic, is it? Too much care, too late. Now I'll show you how you can change that and reduce the cost of health care, follow some of my guidelines here. I'll show you that in just a minute. Let's look at 1990. The end of the baby boomer revolution. And we had no state that had more than 30% of their population, only 14% of, no, no state had more than 14% of the population above 30 pounds of weight. 
Now remember that your body mass index from 18 to 25 is normal, 25 to 30 is overweight, 30 to 35 is obese, and about 35 is morbidly obese. At the present time, 2017, we have 70% of our adult population overweight or obese. It's the highest in the world, above 25 on the BMI scale. So back in 1990, we had, in no states, more than 14% overweight. Look what happened by 2015. We have these southern states right here that had more than 30% than of their population, 35% of their population, overweight or obese, including West Virginia there. Oklahoma doesn't look any better than Texas, as you can see there. We've had an explosion of uh, obesity among our American population. Now, and it was said that a few years ago when when Angela, when uh, the Davis, Michael Dan Davis was on tour in the United States, it looked like that. But he was invited over by a McDonald's few people like that, and that's what it looked like. So again, that is what happened. When people follow the McDonald's diet, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King. Okay, but look at what happened. 1994 versus 2014, diabetes. Because obesity and diabetes go hand in hand. Type 2 diabetes is a result of our lifestyle our diet, inactivity. And you look at this, Diabetes America 2012, 29.1 million diabetics, 86 million pre-diabetics, medical bills 247 billion in 2012, one in five healthcare dollars is spent on diabetes, most of the cost for diabetes care in the United States, 6.4% is provided by government insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, and the military, the rest is paid for by private insurance, 34% are by the uninsured, 3.2%. It is a major health problem in America, and it's affecting our children. There's an epidemic of adult onset diabetes being seen in children. It's estimated among children born in the year 2000, one out of three children will develop diabetes higher in Hispanics than African Americans. If they develop diabetes before they're 14 years of age, it's estimated they can shorten their lifespan by 17 to 27 years. Hard to believe. This may be the first generation which parents have loved their children. When I was in China, back in, I'll tell you more about this later. When I was in China back in April last year, 2017, we opened up our Cooper Aerobics, uh, Cooper Aerobics Center in Nanjing, China. And while I was there, I had a chance to speak. This is uh, what it looked like. That's the Cooper Aerobics Center in Nanjing, China, on 40 acres of land, and a beautiful facility with fitness center and all those various things. But I was asked to speak to the Communist Party. And so I showed the slide. I showed that before 2011, published in the Journal of Medicine, that before 2011, the major cause of kidney failure, requiring dialysis, and even kidney transplants, was, was glomerular nephritis. That's a chronic kidney infection. But after 2011 in China, it changed dramatically. And the major cause of kidney failure, requiring dialysis, and requiring a kidney transplant, was obesity and diabetes. And that's what they're looking for in the future. Why not go to China? Because they asked me if I can help them. It is so frustrating. I can't get anywhere in this country, in Washington, trying to get them to go back and regroup and look at the way we can control the cost of health care. I'm going to give some more statistics in a minute and studies being published, and you can't ignore these things. In fact, some of these things that I'll show in a few minutes, I had the chance to present the you know, Secretary of Health and Human Services, number two man at HHS in Washington. He was here not long ago and had a chance to brief him, and he wants me to come back to Washington sometime this fall and give a 90 minute presentation to people at HHS. Showing that we can do something, if we do it ourselves, but the problem we have, all of these benefits we get from the government and the subsidies and all, that we're not taking care of ourselves. And we think our health is the government's responsibility. It's not the government's responsibility, it's our responsibility. And with the entitlements that we have, it's ruining us in this country. That's one of my messages I've been trying to preach. A little exercise and all-cause mortality. I actually have pioneered stress testing. Worked through all the details of some of the group earlier, worked with NASA. We didn't even have any capabilities for doing uh, monitoring EKGs in the early days. We started doing the stress testing. We didn't have means of, of monitoring heart rate during a maximum performance on a treadmill. This is true. Our first treadmill stress test, I would stand beside the treadmill with the exercise and something on the treadmill, and a blood pressure cuff on his arm. I blow up the cuff, get the systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, get half in between, and then count for 15 seconds. That's the only way we can measure a heart rate on exercise and something back in the 1960s. But well, we've gone a long way, I'll tell you since then. But we, we monitored the treadmill stress test. The treadmill stressing is something we pioneered here, but it actually goes way back. Because it was in the 1800s that in Great Britain, they used a tread wheel to penalize prisoners that they couldn't control. And they would strap them onto this bar 
and make them walk for as long as four, five, six hours just as a punishment. <clears throat> and so uh, as a result of that, they, uh, they called it a tread wheel. They realized all that effort's being uh, expended with no success. So they started putting rocks underneath and grain underneath, and they made it a treadmill. That's a true story. Huh. It started out as a tread wheel and converted to tread meals, a treadmill so they do something with it. So as was, was published not long ago, exercising on a treadmill feels like torture. It's, that, it's not exactly a coincidence. Over the years, American prison wardens gradually stopped using the treadmill in favor of other backbreaking tasks, such as picking cotton, breaking rocks, or playing bricks in England. The treadmill persisted until the late 19th century when it was abandoned for being too cruel. Keep that in mind. The machine was all but lost to history. But when Dr. Kenneth Cooper demonstrated the health benefits of aerobic exercise in 1960, the treadmill and traffic returned, and today well-paid personal trainers have taken the place of prison. You've got a personal trainer, so you're a prison warden. It's hard to say that. So you can see, we've had our experiences with, uh, with stress testing. Okay, this is the treadmill protocol we use. The walking protocol I use is the Air Force. How many have had a triple stress test here? I know several of you have. You probably use the Bruce protocol, which is standards. It's a speed at three miles an hour, or one point seven miles an hour first, and three minutes increase every two, every three minutes. This is a standard incline. We've done over 250,000 stress tests now. It starts with the standard speed of 3.3 miles an hour, and there's the flat the first minute and can increase two percent because of one percent per minute. And that's our protocol. Now to get in the top categories of fitness, we have our fitness classification based upon treadmill time. <clears throat> Very poor, poor, fair, good, excellent, superior. Bottom 20 percentile, next 20 percentile, next 20, next 20, and this is the top 2 percentile. Superior category of fitness, top 5 percentile, age and sex adjustment. At 59 years of age, because of my uh, close relationship with George W. Bush, I went to the White House eight times doing his, his annual examination. And so he always prided himself in being in great shape. Well, he, before he went to, to Washington, he would run off some of our track meets here, our, our Tiger Cup. He was running two miles in 10 and a half to 11 minutes. He was in great shape at that stage. Going to Washington, I used to, we always ask our executives to come through, what's a stress your occupation? And we say it's low, moderate, or high stress. I ask him every year, what's the stress of being president of the United States? He said moderate stress. I can't believe it's not high stress, the most stressful job in the world is under moderate stress. He said it wouldn't be that way except for my fitness. I exercise an hour, six days a week, month to cope the stress of my life, and my faith. That's the way George Bush controlled the stress of the White House and fitness and his faith. Very faithful with this program. In fact, at 59 years of age, he walked 27 minutes and two seconds on the treadmill, the top two percentile for men his age getting. He has a periodic of fitness for a man 30 to 39 at 59 years of age. Retired then in 2006, came back to Dallas, and continued with his exercise program. In fact, uh, I did his last examination at Camp David, went out there and had a wonderful time. But when he came back to Dallas and continued with his program, and he lives here in Dallas and has a, a ranch down in Crawford, of course. But he, uh, this, was, this was October, it was in August, rather, August the 5th, 2013, he was coming through his annual exam. He didn't tell us that two weeks early he had finished a 100 kilometer bicycle ride with his veterans and almost passed out. Hot, humid July, he thought he was just dehydrated. So he forced on the fluids with the Gatorade and all that, and then he came in, put him on the treadmill, his performance was down some 30%. He was way down, he almost passed out in recovery like he had two weeks earlier. We immediately did a CT angiogram, his stress test had always been normal, it was grossly abnormal. The CT angiogram had 99% of the structure looked like a major coronary vessel. We immediately got him in the hospital, over at Presbyterian, all done within four hours, angioplasty in his skin. And we discovered he had a 99% of the Widowmaker. Then when you bought that one all, people don't survive. 99%. He was scheduled two weeks later to have another 100 pound device on the right. If he hadn't come through, that was divine. If he hadn't come through, he would be here today. And he says that. When I was seeing that afternoon, you know, he said, Cooper saved my life. I said, George, I don't know how true you're speaking. Because two days earlier, this was August the, August the 3rd, it was August the 5th when he was on Monday, and August the 3rd, we had a 60-year-old corporate executive running on the indoor track. He was a corporate executive with Exxon. He had a complete, cardi complete examination by his cardiologist a couple weeks earlier. He asked the question, I'm 63 years of age, I've never had a stress test. And Cooper said, I should have one. You don't need one because your resting cage is normal. You have no coronary risk. You have no symptoms. So rest stress testing for you would be worthless. And so he had had a stress test. Saturday morning, 9.30 a.m., collapsed and died. 
and there was no signs of life. We've had five of those over the last 47 years. Only lost one person. That was Frank Bieber back in 19, about 1980, about 1986. Our staff is prepared to handle that, get out to it, put the AED on, shock him all done within nine minutes. By the time the paramedics got, he wanted to go home. You can't go home because you're death experience. So he was, he had to go to the hospital. So we took him on to the hospital, had an angiogram, and it showed the same thing George Bush said. Both of them had 99% instruction of the LAD. If he'd been anywhere else in the world, he would have died because he was wrong since the purpose was dead. And so he had the angioplasty to stay, and I saw him well, some time ago. We were rushing him. He called from across. Oh, Dr. Cooper, it's good to see you again. This is back in 2013. Who are you? I've forgotten his name. I haven't seen him in the upright position, but I'm in the sublime position. And so I'm the one who saved his life. And George Bush says, going around, go to Cooper, can we save my life? So I said, that's the best advertisement. I said, George, it came out in the newspaper. I couldn't tell you these things because of the HIPAA violation. But it came out in the newspaper, exactly what I'm telling you. And I, yeah, I said, George, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how many people had contacted me after you almost died from going through the claim to save your life. And he said, you owe me a royalty on that. You ought to pay me. <laughs> so again, that's our experience with George Bush. But again, we have the same classification for women, but it's much less than 7, 20, 27 minutes. It was 28, was 17 minutes for women at 59, 50 years of age. But back, uh, and as I told you earlier, that even though we had all this criticism of treadmill stress testing, this article published in circulation back in 2016, I pointed out before, points out that fitness can be a better indication of someone's risk for heart disease and early deaths than such standard risk factors as smoking, reach and high blood pressure. Authors recommend that each of us should have aerobic fitness assessed as a part of a medical examination, and if our fitness is on the low side, we should be advised to help to start exercising. We followed some 14,000 people who were healthy for a period of four years. This is back in the late 70s, early 80s. Now, after four years, we had only 13,600 left because 400 people came down with a, with a heart attack or stroke or something that prod. So we had 13,600 healthy people that we then followed for 8.6 years. Looked at levels of fitness versus all-cause mortality and published our most famous article ever, November the 3rd, 1989, in the Journal of American Medical Association. Physical fitness all cause mortality. Front page, USA Today, New York Times. And for the first time in 30 years, the American Heart Association brought along with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and severe smoking and made inactivity a major risk factor. That thing went worldwide. And this was a single article published November the 3rd, 1989, that broke the barrier using exercise and the practice of medicine. Because prior to that time, uh, before at, at old, older than 40 years of age, you should never exercise vigorously. In OU Medical School back in 1952, when a person had a heart attack, they had to lie flat on their back in bed for six weeks. Couldn't get them to go to the bathroom, thought they'd have a heart, another heart attack. This is popular thinking back when I was in medical school, 52 to 56. And we told our men and women who were had a heart attack, if you live in a two-story house, you've got to move to a one-story house. It's not safe to walk up and down a flight of stairs anymore. We used to tell the men, let the wife carry the garbage out and the groceries in because they have fewer heart attacks than men. It used to be true, but now more women have heart attacks than men, but they have them later in life. And they're not as likely to survive a heart attack when they have one because they have bizarre symptoms. Millie, you want to tell them your story real quickly? Yeah. Well, I want to tell you something. It only takes one risk factor. Take the, take the microphone. I, they don't need it. You can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> a year ago, uh, the day before 